the Sayana Shushinskaya power plant tragedy, new CCTV footage has been made public. A janitor wiped floors in the machine hall just minutes before a deadly mass of water destroyed the three generators, burying 75 workers under the rubble. Panicked employees rushed to the exit. The rescue operation has been going on for more than three weeks, with the death toll rising practically every day. The 74th body was found on Wednesday. One more woman is still missing. A feeling of heavy grief is still felt around the region. There is a town near the hydroelectric plant. Particularly recently that was, but um, trying to make the point, I guess, of uh, as engineers, your responsibility for our responsibility for public safety. Um, so let's just look at some different... Under pump pressure can experience the same stresses during pump failure or valve closures. The bladder sewage surge tank is often located below grade... Yeah, so I'm not sure why the, uh, the, the audio doesn't play through on this. It should do on HDMI. Hi there. Um, uh, so if any of you have a live off the grid on a, a domestic well, then typically the water supply in our house is done by a, a pump, not like a sewage uh, um, tank like this, but a pump with a bladder in it, where the bladder expands inside a tank and is supplied by the, uh, the piping work for the house to be able to use the compressibility of the gas as a, as a fluid to be able to um, pressurize the, um, the water in the, the pipes that go around the house so that you can raise it up to uh, the top floor, etc. Usually this is down in the basement. And it's usually um, not a sewage uh, holder like it is in this particular case. Uh, but anyway, that's one illustration. Um, flyboards we've done. Uh, pump storage, yeah, let's do that. Why not? Restructuring of its energy system. system. The European the Union has agreed to undertake major cuts in the greenhouse gas. Green well, <clears throat> so, well, since you work in a department which has energy in its title, energy and mineral engineering, and some of you are in energy-related majors, um, then certainly uh, you know, the whole carbon intensity question and uh, climate change and the evolution which is certainly going to happen in the next uh, couple of decades to lower carbon intensity uh, methods of generating power, reducing carbon intensity in the economies, uh, one of the big issues in renewables, such as wind and solar, is that they only work when the sun shines and when the wind blows. And uh, that's not always when uh, the power is demanded. And so one of the big issues is how, how do you provide storage on a, a massive scale? And there aren't so many scalable methods. I guess there's batteries, on huge banks of batteries, the same as you'd use in uh, cars on the, on the bed of a, a Tesla, for instance. But uh, pump storage and compressed air energy storage are two methods uh, that are used. One related to this part of the class is, is pump storage. The idea is pretty straightforward. Um, at night time when electricity is cheap, uh, say from running nuclear power uh, plants which can't be dialed down very easily, uh, you can use that inexpensive electricity to raise the potential of some water up to a higher elevation. And then when demand peaks at uh, breakfast time or in the evening, then you just run it back down through the system. And of course, it's not a, uh, an energy-free system because you have to provide energy by way of um, the motors, which then become the turbines when you run it back through, which aren't 100% efficient. But also related to what we're talking about in this class now is there are pipe losses. So you lose energy when you push it up to the higher reservoir along the pipes, and then when you run it back down to it, those same pipes sap the energy away because it always works, friction always works against you as, as you flow. And so pumped energy storage is uh, something that exists. Uh, if you listen to the background on this, it'd be making the case that um, Norway has a great resource in that regard just because it's so uh, mountainous um, with very steep, uh, steeply rising cliffs up in, in fjords and has lots of uh, potential for that, much of which I think is built out. I remember reading a paper the other day that looked also at using um, some of the reservoirs offshore 
uh, in the northeast uh, of Scotland, there's lots of wind farms. And so the idea is to be able to take um, the power from that, compress air uh, underground in reservoirs, pre-existing depleted North Sea oil reservoirs, and to look at the capacity not for kind of a daily cycle, which we talked about. So pump storage is typically daily. You do it at night, you run it through in the daytime, and then you repeat on this diurnal cycle. But here they're talking about six months storage capacity to be able to store enough electricity in the summertime to be able to use in the wintertime. Uh, so to be able to do that. So energy storage is one of the, the big challenges um, to be able to do it in a, a scalable way. Um, so a little while ago now, uh, you know, nine years ago, I guess, uh, but again related to pipes, uh, the Deepwater Horizon disaster with, with the famous movie related to it, um, where I think the, the well bore that went down to the reservoir, typically it's uh, grouted in with the annulus between the steel casing and the, and the, the well bore is uh, <clears throat> sealed so nothing can come up the side of it, so that everything that comes up the pipe in the center is what um, is used uh, and goes out of the rig and is used uh, is collected in tankers and or put in a pipeline but in this case the the gas went up the the annulus outside the um, the vertical drill hole and ended its way up onto the rig floor and uh, the resulting fire explosion and fire was what uh, killed a number of people uh, or so uh, and of course, uh, another one that's related to this, which, I'll, which I think is on mute, is the whole technology of drilling, um, which is, you know, the, the so-called shale gas revolution, which has happened in the last decade or decade and a half, is based on a couple of pieces of technology. One is uh, horizontal drilling. So instead of going through the reservoir and having a very short time in the zone, uh, you bend the drill stem to be able to spend a long time in uh, the reservoir going along it. So you maximize the, the length of uh, the borehole that's in the reservoir, maybe um, kilometers that are set, spent in there, and also massive hydraulic fracture. So you uh, go in, you put down casing, you push uh, concrete out of the bottom of this hole so it seals the casing into the location, um, you extend the laterals to be some length, you advance casing in that as well, and then you uh, grout it in by pushing a slurry of concrete in through the annulus and then up the outside of the pipe and flushing it out with water interior so you have a, a, an open hole, and then you put um, a perforation gun in there. And so that is just shaped charges which get put against the uh, steel wall of the casing and blow through it and go into the um, the rock with perforation tunnels, not as big as this, maybe of the order of, I don't know why it keeps on wanting to do that, and then once you have that, you uh, inflate the um, the perforation holes with uh, high pressure fluid and you hydraulically fracture it. And so it's stopped here for some reason, so it won't do the rest of that animation. Oh, yeah, so. And then it extends these small fractures, maybe, well, not maybe, hundreds of meters into the formation to be able to basically increase the surface area that you have contact with. And so all aspects of that, in some degree, are fluid flow and pipes. Uh, the pores within the shale are tiny little capillaries, maybe nanometer in diameter but are small conduits. You can think of them as conduits. The fractures that you develop from the well bore are planar conduits, which also have friction factors attached to them. We talked about it last time. Uh, for laminar flow, instead of being 96 over Reynolds, 64 over Reynolds number, for a parallel fracture, it's 96 over Reynolds number. Um, the flow in the perforation tunnels, which are tubes as well, and then ultimately the flow in the pipe that goes up to the, to the surface. So many of the things that we are are dealing with in, in this class, in this kind of mundane topic of flow in pipes, which is pretty well developed, relate uh, to a whole host of different pipes in different uh, different circumstances. So, so that's just giving some kind of exposition of what some of those are. And the other things we looked at, we looked at the San Bruno pipeline, uh, gas pipeline near San Francisco airport, where the issue is pressure and corrosion and fatigue. 
Um, Southern California, early earthquake warning systems. One of the reasons for that is that if you get an early warning of an earthquake because you get shaking somewhere else, that the seismic waves still have to travel to where you are, then you can shut off the gas, gas line straight away so that when uh, it reaches you, uh, they don't rupture and uh, cause, cause a hazard. Uh, you saw the, the horror footage of Russia from an underground power station for a hydro dam. Um, and we have looked at before these, um, an obvious use of pipes, right, to be able to provide this umbilical where you have a sled which is with a motor in it, which supplies fluid to the backpack with the, the jets on it and you can use it for these kind of interesting recreational activities. So that's kind of where we are, I guess, in, in terms of looking at pipes. So that's perhaps a reason to be able to, to be interested maybe in, 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 in pipes. So that said, um, what I wanted to do today was just go through some examples. So today we'll talk about some examples. Tomorrow we haven't yet talked about networks of pipes, but we'll do that um, on Friday, not tomorrow. And so today I just wanted to, to go back and look through what we've talked about in terms of pipe flow. And maybe even rather than writing it out, because we've talked about it so often, is this basic idea that we might like to be able to think of things in terms of the kinds of flow problems we define merely in these three types of behaviors. It's a bit artificial in some way because we're just solving the systems, but it matters exactly what we know and what we want to determine. And they range from the simplest cases, which we did yesterday for, or Monday for a type one problem, to more uh, difficult cases. And so that's what I thought we'd actually do today. So I'll provide a, a preamble as we usually do. Uh, and just make the point that when we're talking about pipe flows, we're still on there, then we're often talking in terms of either a system that looks like this, which we've drawn many times, where uh, we can define heights in this system. And typically, if we do that, we can write V1 and V2 as being equal to zero. And solving the system for that behavior. Uh, in which case, also on the surface, we can write P1 and P2 are equal to zero. And straightforwardly, the magnitude of this elevation drop between these, which is Z1 minus Z2, is typically equal to the head loss in the system, right? Because we have to flow along this, this comp compartment. If we're only given a, um, a tube, which is also the form of some of these problems, again, written between an upstream point and a downstream point, and we always have to do it in this order because it matters that we lose energy as we go from upstream to downstream. Then in this particular case, um, the velocities uh, are not necessarily equal to uh, zero. But I guess I should have done this. But in this particular case, if the cross-sectional areas are the same, then the velocities upstream and downstream will be the same. And so when we write out our expression, which is just the energy equation, uh, plus the pump head, and this is the only expression that we really need. Elevation head, pressure head, and velocity head, plus the sum of um, major and minor head losses. which we also know, right? I hate to do this ad nauseum, but it's probably important to do. And P1 
these are the velocities in the fittings, but these are the velocities uh, at these portions in the pipe. And I guess the only point I was making is that if the velocities upstream and downstream are the same, then they're not zero, but they certainly cancel out because they're equal on each side. Um, the elevations in this particular case might be the same on each side. And the pressures that drive the flow would be that the head loss is equal to the pressure difference between upstream and downstream. This is a length, and so this is always also a length, a, a pressure head. And so that's basically the, the expressions that we want to deal with. And so in all of these problems, the, the recipe, if you like, to be able to solve for them is to be able to write this energy equation and to be able to solve it in some way. And the, the point we made last time uh, for non-circular sections So when the pipes, lots of pipes are circular, pipelines and well bores are circular because they're drilled by tools, but uh, ductwork in buildings, for, for, interest, for example, is not. Then we can use what we refer to as the hydraulic diameter. In all our calculations, so that is that the hydraulic diameter is equal to four times the cross-sectional area of flow divided by the perimeter and so on a duct then the area is basically this and of course the perimeter is this and that's true for uh, any shape that we want to choose and so our system is that we want to know what Reynolds number is typically, which is equal to a velocity, um, a density, and a hydraulic diameter, which we calculate from this, and viscosity. We use that to calculate a friction factor. And from that friction factor, we can calculate a head loss, which is equal to a friction factor, a length to diameter ratio, where this is a hy hydraulic diameter times the velocity inside that uh, pipe or fitting, pipe in this particular case. And then we use that to be able to, if we know something, we can either calculate from that a velocity or we can calculate uh, the hydraulic diameter and then we have to iterate that to make sure that it satisfies the correct Reynolds number that gives us another update of the friction factor. And so that's kind of the, the uh, calculation sequence that, that we use. And this friction factor of course comes from the, the Moody charts. And so we've looked at it many times and it just matters whether we're plus or minus 2,000 as to whether we have a friction factor which varies with Reynolds number for smooth pipe or whether it's something that varies with relative roughness. And again, this relative roughness is defined in terms of the the hydraulic diameter for the system, which reduces, as we showed last time, to just the diameter when it's a circular pipe. So that's basically our the system that we like to, to deal with. And so uh, it will behoove us maybe just to go through, through some examples just to illustrate this. I suppose the other thing that might be worthwhile mentioning is that in some of these examples, they're not all in SI units, but in some of these examples we use um, what's referred to as kinematic viscosity. And kinematic viscosity nu is equal to dynamic viscosity divided by density. And the reason for using it is that when it goes into this expression here, 
then it's one term that represents the behavior. So I guess you could write Reynolds number as being equal to uh, velocity, hydraulic diameter, and uh, kinematic, viscos kinematic viscosity. And so that's uh, the other thing that <clears throat> perhaps is worthwhile noting before we go ahead with this. But otherwise, we have everything we need to be able to do uh, examples in any of these uh, configurations. One, two, or three. We didn't do one last time, or we did a different one, but let's just do it quickly. Uh, um, see this. And so it's for a, a non-circular section, and the question is, air flows through a duct, it's galvanized iron, it's uh, 0.3 of a meter by 0.15 meters, um, the flow rate is what's given, I'll go into red, and so the question is, what is head loss? And so it's just a matter of writing head loss in this particular form. And the problem always is that we'd like to know what the friction factor is, but to know what the friction factor is, we need to know what the velocity is. Um, and we have some idea what the velocity is here because we know that uh, velocity is going to be volumetric flow rate divided by the area. So that's helpful. So we should be able to calculate what this is. Um, we know that the length is 12 meters. We know the geometry, so we can get the hydraulic diameter, which is four times the area. Area is going to be 0.3 times 0.15 times four. The perimeter is going to be 0.3 plus 0.15 times two around the edges. And so the hydraulic diameter has to be a length also because we're dividing an area by a length, which is a length. If we know what the hydraulic uh, diameter is, um, we can use that in our friction factor calculations. If we want to know the velocity, we can get the velocity from the flow rate, which we know divided by the area. The area is 0.3 times 0.15, which is this. So this is Q, and this is area on the bottom. And it gives us a, uh, a flow velocity. And we can also calculate the Reynolds number if we know the flow velocity, which we've just calculated. If we know the hydraulic radius, which we've already got from here. And if we know the kinematic viscosity of water. And so kinematic viscosity, as we said before, is just dynamic viscosity over uh, density of the, of the fluid, which turns out to be this term here. And so if we have that, we have a Reynolds number, which is uh, 2 times 10 to the 4, almost 2.1 times 10 to the 4. And so somewhere we should have a, a chart. So this is 2 times 10 to the 4. So we're up here somewhere. I guess we need to know what the relative roughness is before we know what to do for that. Uh, relative roughness, if you go back to the table, it says that the roughness is equal to 0.15 of a millimeter. So if you go back to 10.1, long way back. So it's just a recipe. You know that if you're doing this in a, a test, you're given these things, otherwise you can't grade them very well. So the relative roughness for galvanized iron, roughness, absolute magnitude is 0.15 millimeters. And so the relative roughness is going to be that divided by hydraulic diameter, which we've calculated. And so if we go back to this, This is the hydraulic diameter, which is 0 0.2, which is calculated here. So the relative roughness is 7 times 10 to the minus 4, um, which is uh, three zeros and a seven, 7, I think, right? I don't mean to be giving you whiplash here. 
So point zero seven would be right here, I suppose. This is point zero eight. So it's somewhere Okay, that's a bit of a problem, is it? So how does that work? Uh, oh, because it goes up here. All right, of course. So this curve goes up here. So I guess if I make... Oh, not very good. Didn't mean to do this. And this ends up being the appropriate fiction factor which is something like 0 to 7. So point C, what they use here. Well, exactly that. So friction factor, this is friction factor. This is length over diameter, hydraulic diameter. And this is uh, v squared over 2g. And so in this case, it's type 1 problem. We're given the velocity. So we know what the velocity is if we know what the flow rate is and we know that the geometry is. And so everything here we know except for the magnitude of HL. And so we solve for that. Um, same calculation, I think, for... Um, head loss in, in an analogous example, um, I guess all that's different in this, perhaps I won't go through it, but to make the case that if you have a, a duct, where I think the question is basically the same, so uh, you have a flow rate in here which is Q, if you have Q, you can get uh, the velocity as being equal to Q over A. So you know the velocity. So if you're using this, you have a velocity, you have a length of the pipe, you can calculate the hydraulic diameter again, and you can use Reynolds number as being equal to velocity, hydraulic diameter, and I guess if we use kinematic viscosity on the bottom, uh, we can calculate what Reynolds number is, and if we have that, we can calculate what the friction factor is, and we, you can come up with a magnitude of head loss in the system uh, if you know what the other components are. And I guess the only twist to this is in figuring out what pump head do you have to apply to be able to drive this fluid through the system. And so if you look at the... Um, the energy equation and the terms that you'd know um, in this particular case this term uh, you are supplying uh, the velocities cancel out um, and the pressure difference by the system you've just calculated so you've used the head loss the head loss is equal to this and that has to be equal to the pump loss that you're applying to be able to drive fluid down the system. So if you know what this is, then certainly you can calculate what the uh, head of the pump is that you have to apply. And so this is just equal to um, power in watts divided by um, gravity and mass flow rate. And so you certainly know the mass flow rate because mass flow rate is equal to um, volumetric flow rate times density. Uh, you certainly know gravity. You certainly know this as being equal to the pressure drop from upstream to downstream. And so the only parameter that you're left to determine is this power. And so, uh, so I think that's, yeah, so that's it. And so it's actually in English units. And so. I wouldn't be able to solve it if I tried, uh, so I won't embarrass myself by doing that. But that's basically the, the solution here, is trying to use the head loss to be able to calculate exactly what the, the power, they've used P in this case, we've used uppercase uh, watts, rate of doing work in the system. Okay. 
All right. Uh, we made the point that we can address some different kinds of solutions. So type 2 problems we solve for flow rate, so we don't know the velocities. And so there are a couple of questions here, perhaps more complicated than they need to be, but maybe step back and, and talk about how we go about solving them. Still on the, on the board, I see. So uh, the idea here is you have um, a pipe which supplies fluid at some pressure. That pressure is 400 kPa. And um, that stays constant. Initially, the valve's closed. And so the pressure throughout the pipe has to be 400 kPa. And when that's the case, there is this surge pipe. So the idea of a surge pipe is that when you shut this uh, valve, um, the momentum in the flow that's coming through here all of a sudden has to go somewhere, and it wants to knock that fitting off the end of the pipe if it's flowing quickly. And so one thing it can do is it can go up and destroy its momentum in this tower. And so you often see, if you look at hydroelectric plants, you see a big, tall column that is exactly that. It's a surge chamber. So that when you shut the gates to the power station uh, at the base of the outlet where it comes out of um, the, the dam, then the water, instead of hitting the gates and ripping the gates out as they go downstream, you kill the momentum by allowing the water to, to take a circuit into a, a surge chamber. And there's a um, either they're open or they're closed. If they're closed, this becomes a cushion of air that absorbs the, like a shock absorber, absorbs the momentum of the, uh, the fluid that's in there. And so in the initial case, when this is pressurized, where everything is 400 kPa, then the height of this is equal to uh, 0.4 of a meter. Um, and you also know, I suppose, that in this particular case, the pressure all along this has to be equal to 400 kPa. And so when that's the case, then um, we know that the pressure is here. We know that this height here is 0.4 of a meter. I can get rid of this in a minute. And so we could use the manometer equations to go up from 400 kPa uh, we will be reducing pressure by 0.4 of a meter times the unit weight of water, and that will give us the pressure in this chamber here. So we could calculate the pressure when it's closed. So that's one thing we could do. So then you open the valve. We keep the pressure here at 400 kPa because it's a big reservoir. And the question is, what is the new level within this surge pipe? And so we know that when we open this up, then the pressure here won't be locked in, and it will be uh, dissipating from being 400 kPa here to being zero at this point. So we can write uh, the energy equation for this system to be able to figure out exactly what the flow rate is. If we know what the flow rate is, then we can also write the behavior for this flow system to calculate the pressure here. And if we can calculate the pressure here, we can do the same calculation with the manometer equations to go up the pipe. So, so it's more complicated than it needs to be, but that's basically the case. So the question is, um, I suppose, we know initially that this is 400 kPa, so we don't need to do that. When we open the valve, I guess the question is, Uh, what is uh, velocity uh, in pipe? Two, what is pressure at point three in the pipe? And I guess the third thing would be to calculate, finally, which is too complicated, but is to calculate uh, the height of water in the tower. So you just have to divide it. It's a complicated problem, but dividing it up into those parts is perhaps useful. So first part, uh, flow velocity in the pipe. We don't know that. Uh, it's not given. 
We know there's a friction factor of 0.2, so that's useful. It means we don't have to, I guess it means that we're kind of, um, if we look at where we are on the Moody chart, it means we're in the turbulent part, right? So we should be greater than 2,000 Reynolds number. Uh, so this is friction factor. No, not on there, not quite. And so part one is what is the velocity in, in the pipe. And so we can write it between points one and points uh, two. So pressure here is 400 kPa. Uh, big pipe assumption, zero. Um, elevation is the same, so Z1 and Z2 cancel out. V2, we don't know. Um, pressure at point two is the outlet, should be atmospheric. And we have losses in the system. We have a loss in the pipe, which is 8 plus 5 meters long, of given diameter and a friction factor. And we have losses in the fittings, uh, a fitting here and a fitting here. And so if we go through and um, write this out, um, this becomes a reduced equation. So we want to, we know what this is. We don't know what this is, and we don't know what this is. But we do know the length of the pipe and the diameter of the pipe, I think. Yes. Length and diameter of the pipe. And we know what the friction losses would be in different fittings. And so we can write this in terms of the one thing that we don't know, and that is that there's a velocity we want to figure out. And the velocity might be different in the pipe, which is 0 0.2 uh, two centimeters in diameter. And the valve, no, it's the same diameter, I'm taking it the same diameter, right? So if this is the same diameter here, then this term here just goes in to this, right? This goes in as one, and this term ends up being the same one out here. And so the bottom line is, from that, the only unknown we have is this velocity, V1, V2, or V, they're the same. And so we can calculate exactly what this is. If we know what the velocity is in the system, then we know the velocity in this pipe has to be the same as the velocity in this pipe. But now we want to calculate what the pressure is at fitting number three. And so what we can do is we, we can write between this point and this point, where we know the velocity here, where we want to know the pressure at this point, and that's the only unknown that we have. So the second part, so this determines um, velocity uh, two, if you like, which is the same as the velocity. And so we can write the energy equation between this point here and this point here. So this is it here, upstream, downstream at point three, and the losses within the system. If we know that the elevations are the same, so these cancel out. Um, we know that the velocity at point three is zero from the big pipe assumption. Um, we can, we know what the pressure here is equal to 400 kPa. But we don't know what this pressure is, but we do know what this velocity is. And certainly we know the length, which is now eight meters to get there, and the diameter of the pipe we know that the friction factor 
is uh, 0 0.02. We know that we now have just one fitting in here instead of two fittings, which we had before. And so we can take some number for that, uh, whatever they used here. Uh, and the only unknown we have in the system I think long this is two centimeters in diameter this is a number and we know from the previous case exactly what this is because it's no different this is the velocity that's flowing through the fitting and so from that we get a value for P3 and that's probably the only part of this that's relevant to us um, so We've done two other things. We've got the velocity in the pipe. We've got the pressure that acts here. And so what we could do is we can also go up from here to be able to describe this pressure, uh, subtract off the unknown height of water to get to the new pressure in the surge chamber. And the last part of it are kind of convoluted, but it just uses the ideal gas equation, right? It uses the fact that pressure is equal to density times RT, which is the same as equal to the mass of gas over the volume of gas times RT. And so we know that in this surge chamber, the mass of gas is always the same, but the volume changes. And so the volume is going to be equal to 0 0.5 minus h times the area. So volume is equal to 0 0.5 meters minus h, right? Which is this height here times the cross-sectional area. And so we know what the volume of this is. Uh, we can calculate, define the volume of that as a function of h, and we can rewrite this to be able to solve for um, h. So we can write the height in this chamber from the first one. This is being done here. This is just here. So this is the pressure. You'll be happy to be much, much more involved than any exam question would ever be. But this is the pressure divided by r times temperature. So in other words, just rearranging this. Pressure over RT uh, multiplied by V is equal to mass. And that has to be the true both when it's compressed with 400 kPa at the bottom and also when it's less compressed before. The mass of air has not changed. So we can write this equation together for the known conditions when it's either uh, compressed with 400 kPa and this height is 0.4 of a meter, or when it's less compressed because the air is expanded because the pressure at the base is reduced, and we can solve for the value of the, the head. So, and of course, the value of the head should be less than 0.4 because the pressure at this point is reduced. It was 400 kPa. It has to be less. It is less. It's 187 kPa. And so if that's less, then the water here is expanded and it's at equilibrium with the, the constant mass of air that's in the system. Probably more complicated than we needed to, to deal with. Um, so what other questions could we do? Another type one is to solve for um, this geometric system. Uh, it's asking that when you have a pump in the system, that's putting 25 kilowatts into the flow system. Um, it causes a flow rate of 0 0.04 cubic meters. So we know the flow system that occurs. And the question is, what's the flow rate if you take the pump out? And what isn't known is what the initial height of the fluid in the tank is. And so to solve for the first instance, we can write the 
uh, energy equation between 1 and 2 with a pump in it. And if we do that, this is the upstream portion here. This is the pump head. This is the downstream portion. And these are the energy losses. Um, boundary conditions, big tank assumption, upstream pressure is atmospheric, downstream pressure is atmospheric. Um, the elevation at one is unknown. Uh, the elevation at two, if we take that as the datum, that's zero. So in other words, if we do this, this is equal to zero. And um, we know a flow rate. And so if we know the flow rate, then velocity is equal to Q over the area of the pipe. Pipe's uh, 60 millimeters diameter. So we know length, diameter. We know velocity. So we know everything here. Um, and the only thing that we don't know is the height of this. And so we know um, we can solve, yeah, we know the, the, this velocity also. And so the twist is that the nozzle here is less than the diameter of the pipe. And so that this velocity V2 is not going to be the same as this velocity. And so we have to make the distinction between those. Um, but the only unknown that we have here is going to be the elevation of this because we know the magnitude of the head in the pump which is going to be equal to the power which is 25 kilowatts, 25 times 10 to the 3 watts divided by uh, gravity times um, density times the volumetric flow rate. So this term here is just the mass flow rate multiplied by G. We know this is 25 kilowatts. We know G. We know flow rate. We know the density of water. And so we know exactly what this is. And so the only thing that we have to solve for is the value of this head, which is equal to this, 133 meters. Um, oh, this is the part that's provided by it. And so, um, so this is the, okay, this, so this is the initial uh, height in the system is the height of this system minus the power that's put in by the pump. And so now if we take the pump out of the system, then we can do the same expression where now, I guess, uh, we want to know the flow rate. And so we can merely uh, do the same expression as before, but where the pump head is equal to zero, and we use the uh, correct um, height of the fluid within this tank. And it comes out that the volumetric flow rate that we get has to be less than the other one that we had. It was 0 0.04, and now it's 0 0.02. So the fact is that with a pump, you'd expect it to be a higher flow rate with a given height. If you take that pump out and that power is removed, then this flow rate, by definition, it has the same um, viscous losses, frictional losses in the system, and so the magnitude of the flow rate will, will go down. And so uh, that's defining that behavior. And so maybe we should try a, a type 3 one. Uh, we actually tried one last time. Um, this is for a, a duct, question of a duct. And so again, the question is being able to, to dimension it. So type 3 problems are where we want to be able to describe the size of the duct. And it's complicated because we don't um, know the velocity. Because even if we know a flow rate, then uh, velocity is equal to the volumetric flow rate over the area. So even if we know the flow rate, 
we don't necessarily know the cross-sectional area because we're, that's part of the solution that we'd like to solve for. And so type 3 problems are probably the most difficult of the ones to solve. So uh, air is going through. We have a volumetric flow rate Q of 100 cubic meters a second. We want a pressure drop of 40 millimeters of water for every 50 meters of duct. And so with the energy equation, we will have an upstream pressure and a downstream pressure. The elevations upstream and downstream will be the same. The velocities upstream and downstream will be the same. And so the only expression we have is that um, P1 minus P2 over unit weight is going to equal this head loss term. And so that's the, the expression that we have to be able to do. So P1 minus P2 can be no more than 40 mil millimeters of water. So actually this is a, a length. This is, this is 40 millimeters. Pressure divided by unit weight is a length. And that has to equal this particular term here. But the rub is that we don't know exactly what the size of this duct is, only that it's three horizontal to one vertical. And so what we want to be able to know is what this unfortunately labeled term H is to be able to satisfy this minimum uh, pressure drop on 50 meters pipe. So 50 meters would be the length, and the hydraulic diameter of this particular system is four times the area times the perimeter. And for this particular geometry, which is a width of three times height, uh, this is 3h squared, which is the area, and 3h plus h times 2 is the perimeter, which is this. So you have a hydraulic diameter. Um, we have uh, this expression, so we know this length is 50 meters. We know the density of air, which is about one kilogram per cubic meter. And we only know that velocity is equal to Q over A, which is equal to Q over, this is the area, 3H squared. So 3h in this direction times h is 3h squared. So we can define the velocity as a function of this length, which goes into here. We can define hydraulic diameter as a function of length, which goes here. And we end up with this expression uh, where we have a friction factor defined because we know this pressure drop has to be only 40 millimeters of water. And so the only unknown in this is the friction factor. So friction factor is defined only as a function of the characteristic length of the system. And so basically the solution is to uh, use this friction factor in terms of length, which we don't know. Define Reynolds number also in terms of a length, which we don't yet know. And to iterate between these solutions just by choosing a value and solving for it. So assume some magnitude of friction factor. If we do that, then we can calculate um, a value of h. If we know a value of h, we can calculate Reynolds number, which is 3 times 10 to the 6. 3 times 10 to the 6 is right here. For a smooth duct, which gives us a... Um, friction factor of 0 0.096 or 92, I'm not sure which, 96. So use this friction factor of 0 0.096 to calculate what a new geometry dimension is. Use this dimension to calculate a Reynolds number and then use this Reynolds number 3.84 to be able to calculate a new friction factor. use this new friction factor to be able to calculate whether you actually have reached a stable value. And so when you end up with the magnitude of the Reynolds number and the friction factor that match, then you have a solution.
that allows you to be able to solve it. And so that's why it's the, the most challenging of these, because you actually don't know Reynolds number, you don't know friction factor, and you don't know geometry. You have to make some assumptions for a first guess, and then work towards a, a final solution. So, so I think the key point is to baby, basically to be able to divide these up into to manageable chunks, to make sure you realize exactly what you do know, and to be able to solve in a logical fashion for the, the parameters you don't.